Welcome back percussion class. Today we're going to be talking about marching percussion. In relation to the band director guide that I have uploaded onto Blackboard, let's talk about the gear. So with a marching snare drum, of course you have the drum itself. Uh, this is much deeper than a concert snare drum as far as the shell is concerned, but the playing surface is actually the same diameter of a concert snare drum. This is 14 inches. You also have all the accessories that go with it, uh, and the price tag, it certainly mounts a little bit higher because of these things, but they are a necessity. Uh, you'll see that there is a what's called a stadium stand here. Um, this is going to work with all of your Yamaha hardware. This actually has a gas pressurized height adjustment system because these drums are pretty heavy and it helps to support it. Um, we have a stick bag. All the different stick manufacturers make different ones, but this is for one pair. Uh, you can buy bags that hold two pairs as well. And then you have the cover. Uh, it is an absolute necessity to have a cover for these instruments and to protect them from the elements. Um, you would then take them off in performances, but even when we were in the stands, I, I would have uh, those covers on. And the last thing here is the marching harness. And you'll see uh, there have been a whole lot of innovations over the years. Um, they're completely height adjustable um, to any shape and size. Uh, you can make adjustments. Uh, and th there is foam here. Um, they're as, about as comfortable as they can make them at this point. Um, you have to be careful that uh, you're not losing screws on these things. And most of these are uh, the same as the tension rods. Uh, so you can use a drum key on these to make all the adjustments. But just make sure once things get loose, they can get lost. And a lot of these parts need to be replaced over time. Traditional grip is very common in the marching snare drum world. Your left hand is going to rotate, and your right hand is going to be no different than your matched grip. There are three contact points with the traditional grip. First, you're going to grab the stick with your thumb and your first finger, and then you're going to bring your ring finger underneath in combination with your pinky. I call that the unit. And the stick rests right on the cuticle. So that's where the flesh meets the finger, the fingernail. And then the third contact point is your thumb and your first finger. They're going to create a T similar to how we play Stevens grip. So it's a combination of the pad of your thumb touching the first knuckle of your first finger. So we put all those together and this is our traditional grip. Setup in the drum line is very important. Instrument height is no different than what we learned in the very first unit. So the playing surface needs to be a little bit below the belt line. And you have to make sure it's consistent from when they're on stands to when they're wearing them with harnesses. All those things are adjustable in the harness as I showed you earlier. Uh, whenever we call set, I, I ask to do the pinky check at the very beginning, right? So you wanna have your sticks low enough to when you bring your sticks out, you're not changing the distance from your hands to the drum. The other thing is when we do sticks in, the right hand comes over the top into the left hand, and all you have to do is open up that space between your thumb and your first finger, that top uh, contact point, and bring the stick in over the top. And it's important that the thumb in your right hand stays right behind the sticks, and that you still close your thumb and first finger over the sticks in the left hand. So there's no space there, right? So when everybody's at attention, they look exactly the same. The stick out is going to be exactly the same as we did in uh, our snare drum unit at the beginning of the year. We bring the sticks out on seven. Particularly, I, I was a fan of starting the metronome, giving them eight clicks. So once they, they hear the first click, they know what to do. I always like my drum lines to mark time uh, because it is a visual program. You're always gonna be marching. Uh, so keeping your feet moving is super important. There are a lot of different ways that we mark time. Um, but as soon, I would tell them as soon as they hear the metronome, their feet are, are moving. Uh, and their left foot obviously is going to be on one 
in three. That, that's something we practice quite a bit, just getting the feet moving and the stick out. So uh, in addition to that, one last thing I want to add is that they would dot on five, six, seven, eight. So you're here, click, 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 dot, 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 and then there's our attack. Uh, the dotting is super important, and I wanna take some time to explain why that is. The metronome is not going to be going during, during a performance, right? So we, we need to rehearse like we're going to perform. Uh, you want to have your center players interpreting time from the conductor, but everybody else is listening through dots, if that makes sense. Uh, so we clean everything up from side to side first. Uh, and we don't want everybody interpreting time uh, as individuals within the line, right? So the dutting, if we have, let's say, uh, an isolated entrance uh, in the back of the field, uh, we want to make sure that it is together first, right? Instead of listening forward or everyone interpreting uh, the drum major. So that's something that we practice even when we're just doing warm-ups. The drum heads are made out of Kevlar. So it's a very different kind of sound. And that, that's the same material that bulletproof vests are made out of actually. Uh, and the reason they use this material is because you can get a much higher pitch, they're durable, uh, and you can project a lot more with these drums. So getting their play outside. Uh, so they take a little bit of getting used to. They used to be a lot harder, uh, like playing on a tabletop and over time, uh, since the early 90s when these were introduced, um, they've, they've tweaked it and they've made it a better playing surface. Uh, but you'll, he you'll hear that it's, a, it's almost like a gunshot. <laughs> you know, they, they don't sound great when they're played individually. They're meant to be played in groups or lines. So quickly, before I get into the other instruments, I wanted to talk about how you can construct a warm-up. And I gave you a typical warm-up packet uh, where everybody is playing the same thing. There, there are no uh, broken up split parts or voicings for the other instruments. Uh, most every drum line is going to start with a legato stroke exercise. Eight out of hand is my favorite. That is no different than what we're doing in our class. That's where the stick does not stop. It doesn't stop down, it doesn't stop up. Uh, so eights, usually the first thing that everybody plays, and then they call out multiple heights, uh, and they get all that going. And it's a li listening exercise as much as, as it is a physical warm-up exercise. And then from there, I would get into uh, multiple heights. Uh, and, and before we got there, I, I would have them play eights at, at nine, and then three, and then nine, and then three. Uh, and it sets up bucks, which would be our next exercise, where we have... <laughs> bucks so it's down up kind of motion and that's something that we played in our very first unit and then the next thing you're going to have in your packet is probably some kind of a timing exercise uh, and that's where we're going with different natural sticking combinations within a 16th note grid so timing 16th one note the one in the packet uh, we, we start off with two beats of 16th notes <laughs> very first pattern. So we work on right hand continuity where the right hand and then the second measure is working on left hand continuity, playing on the E's and O's. Uh, and then you truncate that pattern later on. So there's your timing exercise. From there, we would have some sort of a rebound stroke exercise. Uh, a, B is the most common, and it refers to the two different double stroke patterns. So we have the first one, one E, a two, and a, ah, E, and four, and one E, a two, and a, ah, E, and four, and one E, a two, and three E, a four, and one E, a two, and three E, a four, and stop. B starts with an eighth note. One and ah, E, and three E, a four, and one and ah, E, and three E, a four, and one and ah, E, and three and ah, E, and one and ah, E, and three and ah, E, and stop. 
And what I mean by a rebound stroke, we're not playing it like this. I mean, I'm certainly playing the correct rhythm, but I'm playing staccato strokes. I'm stopping the stick into the drum, almost a downstroke. Instead, in each of those 16th note rests, I'm lifting the stick and I'm preparing it for the next pattern. Uh, I'll just play all of A, B. Often this is called double beat, but every single drum line has some sort of a combination of this. Probably the last thing that you would do in your warm-up sequence would be a roll exercise. So the rebound stroke sets that up. When you think about it, this rhythm once it gets faster, you'll see that it's an arm motion and I'm getting two for one versus where there's two separate wrist motions. Uh, so working on the rebound stroke slower sets up a good quality roll, right? Where both of those notes have integrity. Uh, chicken in a roll works really well. You could also have a triplet version of that. Here are the marching tenors. They are often referred to as quads still today, even though you can tell that there are more than five, four drums or five in this case. Uh, let's look at the configuration because it's very unique to this instrument. Drum one is right here. Here's drum two, drum three, and drum four. And the reason they're set up that way is that all of the weight is not all on one side. If we went from low to high or high to low, we would be leaning to one side. It would be very, very uncomfortable. And then the next thing we have here are these two accent drums. Here they are left to right, low and high. Depends on the manufacturer. Sometimes they are the same pitch even. Uh, or it is just one single accent drum in the middle. That is equally as common uh, to have a quint. Uh, this is a group of, of six. Tenor players use sticks and matched grip. These happen to have a nylon tip. You can also use puffy mallets, things like that, but I think the sticks are the most common. These are a little bit shorter than your marching snare drum sticks. The stick out is a little bit different because we can, depending on what drums we're playing on the attack, your hand is going to be moving to a different place. Uh, so on seven, you always go out to drum two. And then on B8, you would go to the next spot. Uh, so let's say that uh, you're playing a double stop on drums three and four on the downbeat. You would have five, six, seven, eight, downbeat. Five, six, seven, eight. So it's uniform every time that you do a stick sound. The beating spots are very similar to timpani. You do not play in the direct center. It's a completely dead sound, that's the nodal point, but we play a little bit off center. Uh, it's about one third of the way to the center of the drum and you'll get a lot more ring. With the accent drums, because of the way that they are tuned, we actually play those in the center, so it's a little bit different. When we play the quads, our elbows are a little bit more relaxed, and I relate it to playing a keyboard instrument where you have multiple surface, surfaces where you have to play. So it's taking this match grip idea, and a lot of drum lines play match grip, taking that and making it more this. And at times your elbows are even going to touch your body. If I'm playing on the outside drums, my beads are gonna do what I call the windshield wiper because we want to play equidistant from the rim. And then as I go to the other side, 
it's going to switch. And it's something to work on. As we're going up and down the drums, beating spots are really, really important. Two of the most popular things that are played on the marching quads are crossovers. And you can cross over two drums, you can cross over four drums, you can cross over one drum. If I'm crossing over one drum, my sticks cross right there on the sticks. If it's two drums, it's a little bit more over the hand. If it's three drums, it's even farther up my arm. All depends on the size of the drums. The other thing is what I call sweeps. And that's when you're playing a double beat across multiple drums. So if we're working on A, B, uh, home base is usually drum two. Uh, and usually the first rep of an exercise, the quads just play on drum two just to get the timing down. And then we do voicings is what we call them when we move around the drums. So a typical voicing of A, B, across the drum on that double. So we get used to that. Um, and you can also combine <laughs> sweeps with crossovers. And those are really, really a lot of fun. Uh, and what you want to work towards is not hitting the rims. That's, that's a very easy thing to do on these drums. When we are sweeping across the drums, uh, we want to avoid the rims. Uh, and also, uh, we don't want to bounce, bounce the stick across the drum. You know, that happens pretty often uh, where we lose sound quality and for, we forget to use the wrist when we're doing those kinds of things. Uh, and the other thing that young players do, uh, instead of moving their hand accordingly here, they do this kind of thing. See where I'm just kind of flipping my wrist over? That is bad technique on the instrument. You want to make sure that your hands stay flat. A bass drummer is going to have a mallet. You can see it's made out of the same material as the sticks, except we have a felt ball on the end. There is a taper, and these are designed to where your thumb and first finger are going to grab the stick at the very thinnest part of that taper. You're going to see there isn't any of the stick coming out the back. So if you see that, that means they're choking up too far and they're not getting enough leverage from the stick. The first thing you need to do with your bass drumming students is help them find the center of the head. The center of the head is going to be your beating spot. And once you get them to that position, have them memorize where their hand is on the rim in relation to where these tension rods are so that they can find that every single time. There's a big difference in sound if I'm playing up here versus right in the center. And also they get used to hearing that sound. When your sticks are in on the marching bass drum, your mallets are going to be perpendicular to the ground and make sure that they're both equal. You don't need to grab onto the rim or click the rim when you do it. You're just resting your hands on the rim and they need to practice uh, that motion and getting it the same every time. And you don't want them just to move their wrist to do that. They're moving their elbow into position. So the grip on the mallet and the hand positioning does not change while they're doing that. One of the most common problems I see with bass drum grip is the hitchhiker's thumb, this right here. So instead of moving their elbow, they move their wrist and then it becomes uncomfortable to keep uh, the fulcrum like you would with your normal match grip snare drum. Another commonality uh, is the angle being too acute, right? The way that you get sound on a marching bass drum is rotation. So if, if you are at your full volume, you're going to be palms up to the ceiling. And it's very similar to playing for mallet marimba. Uh, but if you don't have the correct angle here of your wrist, then you don't have any, any leverage. The last thing I wanted to talk about is head angle. If you ever see a bass drummer looking straight forward, they are doing the wrong thing. Uh, and they're probably causing issues with front to back uh, timing. Their head should always be at a 45 degree angle. Number one, they can see the rest of 
the drum line, and they can see the drum major. So make sure that their head is always at a 45 degree angle. So if I play eights, this is what it's going to look like. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and...